In this lecture, we're going to look at the development of international law. Beginning in the latter years of the 19th century and continuing to the modern day. Now, I will go ahead and start with the end. Essentially, we know that international law has transitioned from a system that was based on natural law instead to one based on positive law. International law transformed from a European based system to a truly international order. And finally, international law has moved beyond just regulating states to include the regulation of other parties and entities as well. So in this lecture, we're going to examine the changes to international law in the last century. Modern international law begins in the late 19th century. And it really begins with two conferences, two worldwide conferences held in The Hague in the Netherlands. Now, the first Hague conference brought together as an integrated package a set of ideas and principles that had been uh, swirling around in global society for a good 35 years. Things like peace, arbitration, disarmament, humanitarianism, projects to codify the laws of war. In the words of one historian, it reflected a firm belief in the law's ability to bring order out of disorder and to curb power through the establishment of accepted rules and regulations that would govern international ties among states. So in the second half of the 19th century, through a series of negotiated rules and regulations, international law entered into the international order. Now, this was an international order that was dominated by sovereign states, unequal power, and conflicts of interest. And central to this new order was debate about the nature and extent of war making. So in the Second Hague Conference in 1907, the parties there reflected on ideas about the promises of society to provide rules for the betterment of human society, to codify the laws of war for both land and sea, and finally to seek non-military means, non-violent means, to ensure peace among nations. Now, the second Hague Conference actually had a third conference scheduled in 1915, which had to be postponed because of World War I. Now, if you ask most historians as to the causes of World War I, you would find some difficulty in answering that question. What we do know is that in the late 19th and early 20th century, countries throughout Europe made mutual defense agreements that would eventually pull them into battle. Now, these treaties meant that if one country was attacked, the other allied countries, the other members of the treaty, were obligated to defend them. So, in essence, an attack on one member of the treaty serves as an attack on all of the members of the treaty. So, how did this thing uh, occur? Well, we know that Germany and Austria-Hungary had an agreement. We know that it was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, a Austrian noble, by a Serbian that ignited the conflict. Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, at which point Russia was involved, given that Russia and Serbia were allies. France was then drawn in against Germany and Austria-Hungary because of its alliance with Russia. Germany attacked France, therefore and they did it so by going through Belgium, which eventually pulled Britain into war. And finally, Japan entered the war. Later, Italy and the United States would both enter into the war. And the war would eventually engulf much of the world. So in this map, the green countries are the Allies, the orange are the Central Powers and their colonies, and the gray countries are neutral in the conflict. So, in many ways, World War I was a 
result of the growing importance of positive law. Positive law being treaties that are written down. And the First World War was actually uh, created through an international crime, which is to say Germany's violation of Belgian neutrality. Following World War I, the League of Nations was created and it tried to substitute international authority for the national use of force. But as we know, the League of Nations fell. The League of Nations, established after the war, attempted to curb invasions by enacting a treaty agreement providing for economic and military sanctions against member states that used external aggression to invade or conquer other member states. And in fact, the League of Nations created the first permanent court of international justice, which was meant to arbitrate disputes between nations without resorting to war. Now, the League of Nations changed the status quo. Despite its failure, we know that it changed the status quo by condemning external aggression, by limiting the legal freedom of a sovereign state to pursue war as an instrument of policy. Now, you can see on this graphic the members of the, of the League of Nations, those who joined, those who never joined. And, of course, one of the key non-members was the United States. The United States had decided to avoid um, any more entangling alliances following a great deal of dissatisfaction with World War I and its outcome. Another major positive that resulted from the League of Nations was the Geneva Convention. The Geneva Convention formulated rules about the conduct in war. And at the same time, many nations signed treaties agreeing to use international arbitration rather than warfare to settle differences. The treaties limited the legal right of a state to pursue war as an instrument of policy. However, as we saw, international crises demonstrated that nations were not yet committed to the idea of giving external authorities a say in how the nations conducted their affairs. We saw, following the League of Nations, such key elements as trials for war criminals, including even heads of state, the condemnation of aggressive war, the strengthened prohibition of poison, and the elaboration of humane treatment for prisoners of war. Now, barely three decades after the end of World War I, we lead to World War II. I will leave it to you to uh, do your own research as to the causes of World War II, but you're probably pretty familiar with it. Now, after World War II, international law saw three major developments. First of all, the rise of international organizations, beginning with the United Nations and then a host of other international organizations, which meant that international law was no longer going to be just for regulating interactions between states. We also saw many more non-Western states joining the family of nations. So we, there's a growing importance of states representing non-Western civilizations as members of the family of nations, which of course is going to raise compatibility issues of different cultural values with a system that was originally built on Western principles. And finally, we saw a growing gap between economically developed and less developed countries, thus creating a demand for a new economic order. A key component in modifications to international law following World War II was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This was a resolution adopted by the United Nations that was meant to define the meaning of the words fundamental freedoms and human rights as they appeared in the United Nations Charter. And of course, the Charter binds all member states. 
For this reason, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a fundamental constitutive document of the United Nations. In addition, many international lawyers believe that the Declaration forms part of customary international law and thus is a powerful tool to apply diplomatic and moral pressure to governments that violate any of its articles. The Cold War erupted shortly after the end of World War II. The Cold War was going to be a non-shooting war, but that involved a great deal of conflict between the West and the Soviet Union and its allies. So essentially the United States and its allies in Western Europe versus the Soviet Union and its allies. Now the Cold War was really fought in two stages. The first stage is what we call the containment era and it lasted from approximately 1947 to 1980. After that came the subversion era, which was 1981 to 1991. Now, the containment era was in many ways the positive law aspect of the Cold War. Countries around the world entered into treaties which were designed with the purpose of containing communism. And so we saw things like the formation of NATO in 1949, we also saw wars in Korea and Vietnam, which were essentially proxy wars for the Cold War, but were done so under the authority of international organizations, the United Nations in the case of Korea, and Vietnam being a result of a treaty between the United States and the country of South Vietnam. Now, the second era of the Cold War is, is the era in which there was an attempt to not just contain communism, but to roll it back. Leading the charge was Ronald Reagan, who created what came to be known as the Reagan Doctrine, which provided support financially and militarily for anti-communist fighters throughout the world. And we saw this in Central America. We saw this in Afghanistan. The forces of the United States, the United States provided cash, and arms, and training to those fighting the Soviets, the same group that would later on come to form the core of the terrorist group, Al-Qaeda. It had its roots in the Reagan doctrine and the attempt to fight communism wherever it existed in the war. It was in Nicaragua that was probably the greatest example of the extent of the subversion era. Uh, the United States supported uh, counterinsurgents in Nicaragua leading to eventually what came to be called the Iran-Contra affair. The Contras were those fighting the communist government of Nicaragua and the United States engaged in illegal arms sales to Iran in order to fund the Contras in Nicaragua. Quite a, a convoluted time. Now, I will say that international law suffered from the Cold War from the end of World War II up until the 1990s. Most events that threatened international peace and security were connected to the Cold War, this war between the Soviet Union and its allies and the U.S.-led Western alliance. We saw that the U.N. Security Council was unable to function as intended, in large part because resolutions proposed by one side were likely to be vetoed by the other. And we also saw a bipolar system of alliances, which prompted the development of regional organizations and led to regional conflicts. So the Warsaw Pact, organized by the Soviet Union, confronted the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, which was established by the United States. 
and that it encouraged the proliferation of conflicts uh, on the part of both blocs, whether in Korea, Vietnam, or Berlin. We also saw a problem with the development of norms for protecting human rights. The, these norms proceeded very unevenly, in large part because it was slowed by sharp ideological divisions between the United States, its allies, and the Soviet Union and its allies. But the Cold War ends. The Cold War ends in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed and broke up into its component parts. The Soviet Socialist Republics uh, broke off and became independent for the most part, leaving Russia by itself. Now, originally, after the end of the Cold War, we saw renewed vigor brought to the international public law setting. Uh, you might have heard of the first President Bush used the phrase, the New World Order, and the idea of the New World Order was we are no longer going to be uh, defined by a conflict between these two ideologies of capitalism and communism. We are now one international community. And we saw this, the effect of this, in the first Gulf War. The first Gulf War was a war launched by a broad coalition of allies, and it was aimed at repelling um, Iraq, the forces of Iraq, who had invaded Kuwait. So at its essence, the first Gulf War was a war about the respect for territorial integrity, the territorial integrity of Kuwait. And that was its aim. The aim was to remove Iraq from Kuwait, to push it back to its own borders. And in that respect, the war was incredibly successful. There was a UN mandate which uh, operated to, um, to bring this war to a conclusion. And it achieved exactly what its aim was, which was to remove Iraq from Kuwait. Of course, this is going to lead to the second Gulf War, uh, the second Gulf War having very little to do with the principles of international public law. But before we get there, we need to discuss what came to be called the Humanitarian War. Now, in the late teen, 1990s, in a post-Cold War world, the concept of the humanitarian war was born. Now, motivation for the idea of the humanitarian war came from the failure of the international community to intervene in the Rwandan Civil War. This is a war fought primarily between two large tribal groups in Rwanda, the Hutus and the Tutsis, and there was great amounts of death on both sides, uh, the Tutsis suffering worse for it, and often is referred to as a genocide. Well, the rest of the world did very little to stop the deaths in Rwanda. And what this did was it led to a great deal of thought that here the nations of the world have these large military, military organizations, that the organizations had a function originally to uh, prevent a war in Europe. The Cold War has ended, so what do we do with these large armies? And so the idea was born that we should use these large armies for humanitarian purposes. And so the humanitarian war became an element of international law. Now, we saw the first humanitarian war being the war in Yugoslavia, the war um, against the Serbians, and, in, and the war that led to the in Declaration of Independence by Kosovo. And as you can see in this graphic, one of the books on the war in Yugoslavia called Bombs for Peace, and that was essentially the purpose of the humanitarian war for soldiers to become peacemakers. Now, after 9-11, there was a movement away from international law. The growth of international law that we saw through the 1990s did not survive the terror attack on 9-11. The um, 
after that attack, the United States decided essentially that it had different values from the rest of the world. It did not join the Kyoto Accords on Global Warming. It did not get a United Nations sanction for the second Gulf War, the second invasion of Iraq. And it asserted doctrines that were really at odds with much of the rest of the world. So the United States saw itself as having different values from the rest of the world. And we also saw the United States' status as sole superpower eroded the need for cooperation between states because now it simply didn't matter. The United States' military might was greater than anything any other country in the world, and therefore there was a belief that, well, we no longer need international law. That if you look at the 1990s, there was a great focus on international law. But what did that lead to? Well, it led to 9-11 and this terrible uh, events, tragic events that took place in the United States. So following that, in the beginning years of the 21st century, the United States believed that you were either with us or against us, in the words of the second President Bush. Now, another trend we see at, in the same time period, and at the beginning of the 20th century, certainly at the beginning of the 21st century, it is apparent that individuals and international organizations play an increasingly vital role in international law. Now, historically, as we noted, his states were the only subject of international law. But during the 20th century, a growing body of international law was devoted to defining the rights and responsibilities of individuals. And these rights are defined in different uh, instruments and agreements, the principal one being the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But we have seen a number of additional international treaties aimed at the same thing, uh, treaties on the prevention of the crime of genocide, conventions on elimination of racial discrimination, conventions designed to support economic, social, and cultural rights, and the convention on protecting the rights of children. So the broad rights that are protected in these various treaties include things like the right to life and due process, the freedom from discrimination and torture, and freedom of expression and individually and assembly. So what we've seen then is a growth in the role of individuals as being subject to international law. Now, this also includes the idea of individuals having responsibility under international law. So individual responsibility has led to um, to actions for war crimes committed in the war in Yugoslavia and the war in Rwanda. And so both of those have seen convictions, prosecutions and convictions of war crimes, crimes that were seen as a violation of international law. We also see a major difference between the 19th century international law in 21st century is the prominent position now occupied by international organizations. Now, the size and scope of these international organizations vary. They may be bilateral, regional, sub-regional, global, and they may address relatively narrow or very broad concerns. Some international organizations are legally recognized as international actors. And since the end of World War II, the leading international organization has been the UN. But of course, there are others. There is the World Bank, which provides aid to promote economic development. The International Monetary Fund, which helps countries manage their balance of payment problems. And the World Trade Organization, which supervises and regulates international trade. We also see regional organizations and agreements, such as the European Union, or the North American Free Trade Agreement between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And these, these types of treaties govern areas that 
traditionally have fallen within the domestic jurisdiction of states, not just trade, but the environment and labor standards. So in conclusion, what did we learn today? International law transitioned from a system based on natural law to one based on positive law. It transformed from a European-based system to a truly international order and it moved beyond only regulating states to include regulation of international organizations and individuals. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, be sure to ask me about it. You can leave a note in the comments or contact me directly. Thanks again.